This is Lee's Ferry. I've been here many times. It's where we always load the boats when we start our Grand Canyon trips. This is my friend, Tom Vale. He started Canyon Ministries and took me on my very first trip down the canyon. No one knows the canyon better than Tom, and I was fortunate to have him as my guide on all the canyon trips I've taken. This is Dr. Andrew Snelling, and sitting next to him is Dr. John Whitmore. Both are geologists. You may recall Andrew from our last film, Is Genesis History? Remember, Andrew took me to an extinct volcano in Arizona to discuss radioisotope dating and the age of the Earth. John was Andrew's assistant on this trip. He's been a geology professor at Cedarville University for over 30 years. He's also spent a lot of time studying the Coconino sandstone layer in the Grand Canyon. The conventional paradigm says the Coconino sandstone was formed over millions of years in a desert by the wind. But John's research has clearly shown that it was formed rapidly underwater during the flood. This is a key piece of evidence for the creation model. Little did I know that the same year we released Is Genesis History in theaters, Andrew was embarking on a research project down in the canyon. He was looking for new evidence that many of the enormous layers of sediment we see all around the world were laid down during the flood. One of the things that has always fascinated creation scientists are the huge folds that can be seen in the canyon and all over the world. Andrew had a theory he wanted to test. If his theory was correct, it would be important new evidence regarding Earth history and the geological timetable. These two scientists have spent much of their lives finding evidence that supports the history of Genesis. But in all those instances, their work was never filmed. This time was different. They took a cameraman with them into the canyon to capture what they were doing. When I heard about it, I realized that this was a way to show something most people have never seen, creation scientists doing the actual work of science. How do scientists connect the history in Genesis with the world around us? How do they test their theories? And what did the flood do to create the world we live in today? Our first documentary provided an overview of creation science. But in this documentary, we're going to explore how creation science actually works, because it is important that you see for yourself how scientists do science. I'm Del Tackett. I'm excited to be your guide as we explore the rise of mountains after the flood. Although I wasn't a part of their first trip to the canyon, I met them many times on their journey. And just like the first film, I learned an incredible amount. But this time, I found myself asking questions I had never thought to ask before. So this is John's lab? Yeah, I've been here at Cedarville for 30 years now. Uh -huh. And done a lot of work in this lab and a couple other labs that are next door to this one. Over here we have uh, what's called the petrographic microscope. This is a microscope that's designed for looking at thin sections. And this is what a thin These section... Are the, the slides yep. that Ray produces mm -hmm. for you? Yep, this is what Ray makes. These are from his lab in Calgary. Mm -hmm. And uh, he takes uh, a rock like this and will uh, slice a really thin layer off of it and uh, glue it on a glass slide and then polish it down so you can see through it. Yeah. And, you know, if you hold it up to the light, you can see the light passes right through that. that. Yeah. Oh, yep. that's awesome. And so that allows us to study the sand grains yeah. under the microscope. So It's quite an art to make the thin sections. Yeah. Here's, a, I've got a slide on the microscope right now, and this is one of the thin sections from the Coconino sandstones. And it has uh, what we um, call ooids in here, and these are uh, so dolomite ooids. Ovoid. Yeah, they're, they look like balls almost. And, and what happens is you get a little sand grain rolling around in the surf or rolling around oh, on an uh -huh. ocean bottom. 
as mm -hmm. it as it rolls around, just like a, a kid rolling a snowball. You know how a snowball yeah, gets right. bigger. Yeah. Um, these uh, little sand grains accumulate the dolomite around them. So oh, you can be, see the huh. sand grain in the middle. Yeah. That white spot and all the coating around it. You know, this this was amazing evidence for us. I, I still remember opening up my email looking at this, and I was just amazed because this is just incredible evidence that the coconino was made underwater. You can't make these kinds of things in a desert. Huh. I presented this at a national geology meeting, and I had a, a scientist come up that, that knew I was a young earth creationist mm -hmm. and was skeptical about all the work I yeah. had done. And every geologist would look at that and know that those were ooids, except if we they're in the coconino. <laughs> in front of the knife. Hey, isn't that interesting? Yeah. As soon yeah. as it was so coconino. So it's just, I don't want to see this. Yeah, yep. he, he just would not look okay. at it, would not admit, would not even study them to see if they were ooids oh. or not. And he just said, nope, those can't be ooids, those aren't ooids, and you know, wanted to drop yeah. the subject almost immediately. I pressed him on it a little bit, but he didn't want to. Yeah go any further on so that. So it happens when someone is um, captive in a paradigm, Yeah, they don't want to see any evidence yep. that's contrary to that paradigm, right. and that's yeah. what was happening to him. Yeah, that's yeah. one of the neat things that um, we do as creation scientists. We kind of have a different way of looking at things, mm -hmm. and so we tend to collect data and, and look for data that probably other people miss, or probably yeah. they, they might have seen it, but they really don't think very deeply about right. it and think about the implications. Right. And that's one of the things I think I enjoy most about a creation scientist, because there are so many discoveries out there that are just We're waiting for us. We're not constrained. We're not constrained. We're able to ask questions that they're not asking. And, so and that's we, what's kind of driven you to this research now, right? Yeah. I mean, because the conventional paradigm would have never Gone in to take samples. No, they have to look they've at just, that fold. They've just talked about these folds and just assumed that they were formed long after the rocks right. were formed, and therefore there had to be mechanisms that allowed the rock to bend when it was very hard. As creation scientists, we think these layers were laid down during the flood. The folding occurred only a year later, at the end of the flood, when the mountains and plateaus were rising in the west. If that's the case. We wouldn't expect there to be evidence of the rocks changing under heat and pressure. That's what we're investigating and why we're making thin sections to look inside the rocks. From looking at it, anyone looking at these folds, you, you can see immediately they're so smooth that it seemed intuitively that these had right. to have been formed when they were soft. But we had to go in and get the sample so we could confirm that plus rule out any mm. objections that might be raised. So yeah. it's all part of doing good science. Well, I've, I've been doing research in the Grand Canyon for 27 years. Here in the Grand Canyon, you've got exposed to view virtually a whole slice through Earth history. And so that's why it's important because it's been used at Exhibit A for millions of years and biological evolution. And that's why it's important that creationists also come to the Grand Canyon and say, no, it's Exhibit A for creation and the flood. What's the choice? Yeah, I can do either one, Andrew. Can you deepen up over there? Over here, okay. We're coming into the Tapete Sandstone here, outcropping at river level. This is our target rock unit. This is our first sample. This is the same sandstone as in the Carbon Canyon Fold. It's a good spot because it's something like five miles from Carbon Canyon Fold. If the sediments were still soft, we wouldn't expect to find any difference with the sample here to the sample in the fold. Now, shattered on me. I'm marking where the bedding is so we can reorient it in the lab. TSS standing for Tapeet Sandstone, sample one. Let's, let's stop for a second though and go back a little bit and talk about, first of all, where the rocks came from mm -hmm. and how you got them and why and so forth so that 
who can kind of lead up to what the research is about. Well, a lot of people ask me the question, now why the Grand Canyon? Let's, let's start with something basic. Uh, the reason why the Grand Canyon is a geologist's paradise is that you've got this giant slice in the earth where the canyon and exposes all these layers. It's in a desert. It's almost a showcase in the textbooks about all these different rock layers. And so the question is, you know, when did they form? How did they form? What is their history? We now know that many of these layers that we see exposed in the walls of the Grand Canyon stretch, in some cases, right across the North American continent and beyond. Yeah, so, Andrew, the layer we were looking at in Grand Canyon is the Tapetes. Tapete. Sandstone that's down near the bottom of the Grand right. Canyon. We can trace that layer into the Colorado Rocky Mountains uh, near Colorado Springs. Uh, we can trace it into the Black Hills. And we can trace that same layer up to yeah. Greenland as a continuous yep. sheet with no breaks in so it. So that kind of an understanding of a layer that is so huge leads your thinking more to something global than to Correct. In something Correct. local. So that tells you something not only about the scale, but we think the flood eroded away enormous sections of the pre-flood continents, then deposited that material in layers one on top of the other. It's like a stack of pancakes miles deep all over the earth. And so when we talk about the layers, those layers are all formed as a result of sediment, right? Talk about those layers, first of all, and how they were formed and the layers in that we wanted to look at and why we wanted to look at them. We wanted to look at those specific layers because they're at the bottom of that huge stack. If those layers were still soft when they were folded, they can't be hundreds of millions of years old. So imagine a sand being washed up on a beach. How does it get cemented? How does it turn from sand into sandstone? Mm -hmm. So what happens is when it's deposited, there's water in between those sand grains, but the water has chemicals dissolved in it. And so when the water dries out, those chemicals precipitate and fill in all the spaces between the sand grains and harden it, making it a cement. We think a lot of that cement and some of the grains would have broken if the layers were hard when they were bent. Well, after the layers were deposited, everyone agrees that the Colorado Plateau was pushed up. It was part of the mountain building event connected to the Rocky Mountains. We think this was happening at the end of the flood when major earth movements were creating new plateaus and mountain ranges. The folded layers are the result of those movements. It's like a book. Here are the, are the various sandstone, shale, These limestone. are all the sedimentary layers. Sedim that now exposed by the canyon, but this was pushed up. Now, what's interesting is that the eastern side of the canyon, the layers have been buckled like mm -hmm. that. They haven't been pushed up uniformly. And so there's been folding of the layers. And that was the focus of our research because the conventional view is that these layers were deposited over 500 million years ago. And this folding, they say, didn't occur until uh, 70 million years ago. So there's a gap of several hundred million years. And if that, in that time frame, you'd expect the water to dry out between all the grains, the cement to harden. Now, you know as well as I do that if you try to bend that rock... Right. What, what's going to happen? <laughs> well, first of all, it's I can't bend that rock, but oh, if I think about this yeah, one... Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's yeah. going to happen? So if this, for example, let's say this then represented mm -hmm. that plateau that you're talking Correct. about. Correct, yes. And so if we were to put pressure underneath this in order to try and bend it, mm -hmm. and if it's hardened like this, then it's, we would say... It's going to snap. It's going to crumble. It's going to crumble. So you, you can bend a rock like this, hard rock, like you've got there, but you've got to do it slowly with pressure and heat. And the heat and the pressure makes the rock plastic mm -hmm. and, in a sense, makes it like putty and it will bend slowly. But because of the heat and pressure, that is going to affect the mineral grains. It's going to affect the cement that binds the mineral grains together. In the conventional paradigm of millions of years, you can only cause that bending if you have heat and pressure causing metamorphic changes in the rock. And those changes will show up clearly in the thin sections. And therefore, we want to look under the microscope. Has there been, is there any evidence in these layers that have been bent of those metamorphic mm -hmm. changes? And that was a 
a major point because we have to be able to show that there hasn't been those changes if it, it, it all occurred very rapidly when the rock was still soft. So that's what drew your attention to um, the folds and the desire then to do the study and the research mm -hmm. um, at, a, at a more detailed level. And the interesting thing is, Del, because we have a different framework of thinking to look at these issues, we're asking different questions to what the mainstream geologists are asking. They haven't taken samples and, and cut these thin sections to look at the grains under the microscope. But that's, that's very basic to understand. People can't, it's hard for people to grasp, but you know, you, we go to, we're going to go to the microscope scale to explain and, and look at the timing right. of the formation of mountains. Right. We're zoomed in on this research project on these folds, but they are part of a bigger context. What produced these folds? So at the end of the flood, as the ocean basins were sinking and pulling the floodwaters off the continents, an oceanic plate from the Pacific Basin went under Western North America at a fairly flat angle. And as a result, this plate caused a number of mountains and plateaus to rise up almost to the middle of the continent, which is why there are so many high plateaus and mountains in the Western United States. One enormous area that was lifted up was the Colorado Plateau. But the plateau didn't lift up evenly, and so some areas were pushed up higher than others. Now here's what's interesting, Dell. A very large fold that goes through that area, hundreds of miles long. It's the same one Andrew was referring to, and it's called the East Kaibab Monocline, where mono refers to one bend or one fold. The monocline formed a dam. Water started collecting in the lower area. And so a big lake developed and eventually found a weak point in the monocline and started to flow through it. And it was that catastrophic dam burst, we believe, that carved out the Grand Canyon. And so it's because of the carving of the canyon that we have these folds exposed to view. And these are the places that we sampled. Let me show you on a map uh, where we Oh yeah, I'd love yeah. to see that. So this is a geological map. You can see it's, it's been <laughs> well used, well used. Well used, I've had this out in the Grand Canyon many times in my pack. You know, I can tell that uh, if you're gonna be a geologist, you need to learn how to unfold and fold maps. That's right. Yeah, you'll notice that this is a very colorful map. Yeah. Um, every color on here is a different uh, kind of rock layer. When we floated down the canyon and looked right. at the layers, these colors now represent yep. what we were seeing. Yep. Every, every color is a different layer. Mm -hmm. The Grand Canyon goes uh, through here, it starts way up here. In fact, the, the very upper part is not even on the map, but it comes down uh, through this way, uh, wraps around down this way, goes off the map over there, and this is just the eastern part. Yeah. There's a whole other western part uh -huh. that sits over there in Lake Mead after that. Mm -hmm. Is Carbon Canyon on here? Yep. Yes, Carbon Canyon is up here. Okay, here we come down just below 60 mile rapids here. We took a regional sample just above the Little Colorado River. And we came down here, parked, and Carbon Canyon is up here. Okay. And here's the fault line. Uh -huh. And the fold is right on that fault line. That's the Butte Fault. And you can see it's a, it's a north-south, and that marks the edge of that monocline. Yeah. So this is where you took the samples? Yes, parked the boats, walked up to the fold. Carbon Canyon is a side canyon to the main Grand Canyon, and it cuts through the folded layers in the East Kaibab monocline. So we're coming up the drainage here of Carbon Creek, and uh, got to go left and climb up this scree slope where there's steps. And so by hiking up Carbon Canyon, we come to the place where the Tapete Sandstone is actually bent through 90 degrees in a spectacular bend without the shattering. If we look ahead, we can follow the layering essentially horizontal. And as we get towards the end of the canyon here, you can see the layers turn up to the skyline, almost vertical. So you can see the bend in the rocks. You know, you've been there before, but you've only got a mental picture. Now you're there in front of it. 
you want to check your strategy. You've already thought about what your strategy is, but now you've got to look. Can I trace one particular band in the rock layers through the fold? We've uh, put orange duct tape in places where we want to sample and that helps us keep track of the bed. So we make sure we follow the same bed uh, through here. On my camera, I've got a, a GPS unit. And so when I take a photograph, if the GPS is locked in, it will tell me precisely where I took the photograph and where our sample came from. It's uh, getting really upfront and personal with the rocks. Take notes to record the location of the sample, the thickness of the bed, the dip and strike of the layer, if we can obtain that information. So it's a, it's a very intense, and of course you're, you're working on a, on a cliff face, so you've got to watch your, your footage. Oh, that's a biggie. And then we would go in and we'd take those samples in the specified way and mark the sample so we knew where was the top of the bed, because you've got to orient it, labels the bag, put an extra card in with a sample number. Uh, it's back to basics. This is about actually taking measurements in the field, observations in the field, making notes, and then going to look at the samples under the microscope. It's very basic geology. And then you get your samples and you get out of there as quickly as possible back to a, a more hospitable place. You're, uh, you're in Disneyland here, yeah? Yep, absolutely. What is this to a geologist? This is heaven on earth. <laughs> The nice thing about geologic maps is that the geologist will often draw a line across the map and then he'll show you what the layers, what uh -huh. he thinks the layers look like underneath. Yeah. So you can see these lines, like here's a, a B right here and all the way up there is a B primed. And you can come down here to the map and here's the B oh, that's and all the way cool. over there is the B primed. Awesome. And notice that this particular line crosses the structure that is called the East Kaibab monocline. And that's the fault and fold partly associated with the Carbon Canyon area. And so right here is where uh, the East Kaibab monocline goes through. And you see how the, the, rock. the rocks are nice and flat right here. And then all of a sudden there's a bend. Yes. And there's a lower elevation uh -huh. down over here than back over here. And so what happened, what we think happened is there's a the rock down here in the basement is really hard and it, it broke and faulted and that's the fault right there. But the, the rocks on top are relatively soft. Mm -hmm. And so as the hard rock pushed the softer rock up above, instead of breaking, these rocks up mm. here bent and yeah. folded. Mm. It's like having a layer of wet sand and underneath you've got a wooden block and you push the wooden block up and the sand will drape over yeah. the... Right. Uh, that occurred uh, somewhere then close to the flood time. Yeah, well, the Tapeach sandstone was deposited early in the flood. And at the end of the flood, when the earth movements took place to re-equilibrate, that the folding occurred then. And the sediments were still damp and soft, and therefore they could bend quite easily. And then they dried out, and we had the cementation of the grains afterwards. And then we, we motored down here, and uh, all the way past uh, Phantom Ranch, all the way around here, come around to the, this is the monument fold. This is still oh, okay. the Tapeach sandstone. It's actually marked on the map that there's a fold there, but there's also a fault line. There's a fault underneath, and yes. the, the, the rock underneath pushed up okay. and made the rocks on top the fold because they were soft. We're gonna be uh, looking at this big fold or this big bend in the rock. 
Uh, you can see the, the granite that's been pushed up right here and uh, making a big fold in the tapis. And it looks like the tapis is bent plastically uh, right over top of this fault. It doesn't look like the fault has extended up into the tapis sandstone at all. And I think the easiest way to sample it is to come over and go up that slope to get to it there and then come over and get to it on the other side of that slope. Maybe that thin bed might be the better one to get because we're in the finer grain that's Oh yeah, 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 I agree. Yeah. I agree. Well, why don't you and I go up with the ladder. Okay. Let Andrew stay down here. We'll tape everything okay. that we can do. The plan is to sample two beds. Okay, the fold, the fold comes like this and does this. Okay, that's the overall profile. So because of the scree slope, we're going to sample in here and we're going to sample in here. Well, it's just an interesting area that we want to try to, to sample. So we're going to take a sample right where this bed is kind of smeared. And this has shifted this way, but it did so without, without cracking the rock. So the rocks pose some questions to us. The folds pose some questions to us. And not just to a creation scientist, but to a conventional scientist as well. But then we want to go in there and study the rocks and look at that fold and look at the rocks under the microscope and see which paradigm fits the best. And so the argument is not about that physical evidence, it's how you interpret that physical evidence. And to interpret it, you've got to have a framework and our view of history is the Genesis is history. The Bible is an eyewitness account given to us by the Creator who was there. And it gives us a time frame. It gives us the description of what happened during the flood. And so we can take that description and look at the geological implications, for example, and then go out and test those implications. Good, perfect. Okay, seven down, one to go. So in your research was then to take samples in those folds, but you also took other samples. Yes, well, up to, as a control, we obviously collected samples away from the folds so that we can make comparisons. Mm -hmm. That's why we took samples from where the rocks are folded, and then we took regional samples from where the rocks are flat but all in the same layer. If all the rocks from the different locations are the same, that's a strong indicator the layers were soft when they folded and therefore not millions of years old. And we made it all the way down and we did another regional sample at Doris Rapids. Doris Rapids up in here. And then Matt Catamoeba, we looked yeah. at a fold in the Muav. But there were other samples we got in between of the Bright Angel Shale and the Muav limestone because of these are the three units. And off the map we went to where we helicopter out, there's a fold there. Yeah. You got your pick on your side, right. you got your loop around your neck. Ready to go up the ladder. And you got, <laughs> got all ladder. my tools on me so I don't have to come down more than once. A ladder like that, well, because the fold that we want to look at is at the base of a cliff, but it's still quite a climb up to it. And it's a vertical face. So we brought this ladder along so that we can get up to it. This has been in the making for what, four, four years now? Four years. We've talked about this for a long time beforehand, but uh, the planning to make this happen has been going on for four years through the whole process of getting permission to do the sampling. This is significant because you can see why it's being folded. That sort of plasticity that enabled it to bend like that without shattering. You take a hard rock, it would have fractured all the way through there and you wouldn't, you'd see lots of evidence of that. But mm. you don't, sure there's joints there, there's cracks, yeah. but they're not shatter type mm. cracks. Mm. Yeah. The whole rock would have just disintegrated with the bending motion. Mm. You're not afraid of height, obviously. No, I've done a lot of, <laughs> lot of house painting in my years, so been on a lot of ladders. So this, this ladder was very stable 
and uh, glad my wife wasn't here. <laughs> <laughs> so that's an overview of the project. And, you know, as we said before, the reason we wanted to do it is nobody had actually collected samples from these folds and mm -hmm. looked at the rock under the microscope and, and studied them to determine the, the timetable for deposition, folding, and, and the cementation. You know, which, what's the order, which is critical. I just think that this was one of the best raft trips I've been on in the Grand Canyon. I think we collected some good samples on the trip and we'll be anxious to see what these things look like under the microscope. Well, Andrew, here we are. What do you have to say? Well done, everyone. Fantastic trip. When we were in Cedarville, we were looking at the maps and discussing all the research. But I asked John if there was a place where we could actually go to see the forces that caused those folds, and that took us to the Uinta Mountains. John, the vista here is <laughs> unbelievable. What are we looking at here first? So we're at the kind of the western end of the Uinta Mountains. They extend here out to the east for another 100 miles or more. And uh, we're looking at some of the higher peaks in the Uintas, probably right around 13,000 mm. feet here. <laughs> it's beautiful, isn't it? It is, it, it is phenomenal. John, can you take me back here for a second? Let's talk about how we got all of this. Yeah, Del, I think these mountains that we're looking at actually rose at the end of the flood. So the earth was destroyed by the flood. And then as the flood ended, Psalm 104 tells us that the mountains rose up and the valleys sank down. I think these mountains that we see in Western North America and all the other high and rugged mountains that we see around the world rose up at the end of Noah's flood. That's why they're so high. They were never eroded by the flood. Other mountains that rose up earlier in the flood, like the Appalachian Mountains or the Atlas Mountains, were eroded down to the smaller mountains that we see today by the floodwaters. So during the flood, we have those massive sedimentary layers that are being laid all over, like the Tapeat sandstone. <laughs> you told me just covered most of North America. Right. Massive, massive. But they're horizontal, right? They are. Most all of those yep. layers are horizontal. What happened then? Well, we see some of the horizontal layers that are in these mountains towards the tops of these mountains. And these horizontal layers actually formed below sea level. So they formed during the flood, but they would have formed at depths that were yes. much lower than we're, we're 10,000 feet right now. And so they would have formed under the flood waters. And then after the flood, they would have risen uh, to the heights that they are now. Was that a, a miraculous event or do, can we see forces at play that God, of course, was involved in that? Sure. But what forces? would move uh, mountains this size. Well, we think it goes back to our idea of catastrophic plate tectonics. And so at the end of the flood, a plate was going under Western North America, creating the mountains like the Rockies and the Uintas. In South America, another plate was being subducted to create the high mountains and volcanoes of the Andes. And in Asia, two different plates collided to form the enormous mountain ranges of the Himalayas. In all these instances, we think the plates had to be moving very quickly to have the energy to create such high mountains. But these mountains formed at the very end of the flood, and that's why they're still so high. Well, I guess the point, uh, John, I hear you making is that even after the flood is over and uh, Noah has <laughs> landed in the ark, mm -hmm. Uh, that there are a lot of catastrophic events that are going on all over. That's and right. That is what then shapes a lot of yeah. what we see. That, you know, when Noah gets off the ark, it's not the end of catastrophe. Uh, to raise mountains up like this, uh, you're going to have big earthquakes. And as these mountains rise, they're full of this wet, unconsolidated flood sediment. That's a recipe for huge landslides. Some of the biggest landslides that we know about are here in the southern part of Utah. So don't think of the mountains rising up as we see them right here, but 
think of a lot more rock in uh -huh. between here as these mountains originally rose up. And so uh, that erosion would even be more uh, profound, I guess. Yeah, we have big storms uh, coming into the continents, and especially if you get those storms at high elevations like this, uh, that water has a lot of energy as it runs downhill, uh, many thousands of feet. Um, also at higher elevations like this, uh, you have the opportunity for snow to fall. And if you have large amounts of snow that falls, you get the development of glacial ice. And that glacial ice covered a lot of uh, the northern part of North America then, did it not? Yeah, it covered much of the Rockies. As you know, in Colorado, there's lots of glacial valleys there. Glaciers are one of the things that can carve those deep, steep-walled valleys in various places. Would it be safe to say then that what we see uh, today, not just here, but all over the world, uh, is not what Noah saw when he got off the mountain? That's right. And so those kinds of things, those kinds of catastrophes, help shape, help sculpt uh, the mountains that we see today. Really nice scenery up here, isn't it? It is beautiful, but it brings to mind here as we look at this, we have a lot of slanting of these layers. What's going on? So uh, you can see the red rocks and the lighter tan colored rocks back there. You can see they're sitting in an angle. So these layers used to be flat lying. They're deposited in a marine setting. And these are the same rock layers that you would have seen down at the Vermilion Cliffs at the eastern end of Grand Canyon in Arizona. So here we are all the way up in northern Utah and we're still seeing the same layers but these layers would have had to be flat over this whole area all the way down to Arizona and all the way up extending into Wyoming. And then if you want to think about it as a bubble uh, or kind of rising up here, that's when those layers uh, became slanted. So we have the, the layers here on our right. Do those layers then continue and go underneath they the do. red layer? Those go right underneath the red layers that we see out here. So there's a whole thick package of rocks that have been kind of churned up on edge right in here. So that means all that we see on the left used to be here on the right. Is, that's that, right. is that right? Yeah, so these layers, like this red layer, uh, the Moenkopi, used to extend up and over. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot that's been eroded away in here. And as the Uinta Mountains pushed up, um, these layers would have extended over top of the Uinta Mountains. And so what we see is just the remnant that's left. And so as we look off to the north, uh, we're looking out toward the Green River Basin. And so as these mountains rose up, it kind of made a high spot that water couldn't run through initially. And we had a big lake that formed out there. And all of this is happening uh, approximately the beginning of the Cenozoic uh, period around the Earth. Now, wait a second, you mentioned the Cenozoic. Uh, what is that? Where does it fit into all well, of Well, geologists uh, look at the history of the Earth in about four different times, if you will. And it doesn't matter if you're a, a creationist or a old Earth uh, geologist. Uh, we all recognize about the same four periods of time. We think they ex you know, had different lengths of time. The, the two views differ from each other, but uh, the one that's deepest is the Precambrian. And we'll actually see those in the core of the Uinta Mountains. And then on top of the Precambrian, we have the Paleozoic. Here's some of the Paleozoic rocks, and we think these would have formed earliest in the flood. And then over here, beginning with these red rocks, that's the beginning of the Mesozoic. It means middle life. So we have Paleozoic, old life, Mesozoic, middle life and then uh, the most recent period is the Cenozoic which means new life and as creation geologists I, I think these Paleozoic and Mesozoic rocks would have formed during the flood year so we have about a year's worth of time to form all that rock and much of that we can see uh, right in here but then after the flood as this erosion is happening you know where is the sediment going um, these mountains get lifted up and then the eroded sediment is going into the big lakes that are forming out there. We often talk about a lot of these sedimentary layers being made during the flood. I think there's a lot of sedimentary layers that are gonna be made after the flood as well. So we can piece together a whole series of events. So we know that these Paleozoic layers had to be made first, then the Mesozoic layers had to be made, 
the uplift happens, and then after the uplift, we get those lake sediments out there being laid down. Are those lake sediments then uh, laid down fairly close to the end of the flood, or? I think they're laid down after the flood was over. So there's a lot of good reasons why we picture the Cenozoic as the end of the flood. And we see all these mountains rising up in the, in the earliest part of the Cenozoic. And so if you have mountains rising back up and not getting eroded down by floodwaters, that's a hint uh, geologically that the flood's over. Now, John, if, if all of those forces are, are lifting up the mountains uh, at a time where all of those layers are, are still soft, uh, then we wouldn't expect to see them crumble and break. Would we see them fold? Is that what we saw right. in the canyon? That's right. So we're going to drive just a little ways from here into the core of the Uinta Mountains, and we'll see one of the limestones that's bent and deformed as this uplift took place. And that tells us that these rocks were moving around while the stuff was still soft, just shortly after it was laid down. John, I have to admit, this is this is pretty impressive. So we're looking at the brown rock here, which is the core of the Uinta Mountains. And we're looking at the tan rock up there, which is the Madison limestone. It's the same limestone that we see in Grand Canyon that we call the Redwall limestone oh, okay. there. Uh -huh. The same kind of thing is happening here that happened in Carbon Canyon at the same time. So the folding that we saw in Carbon Canyon, uh -huh which doesn't seem to be nearly as massive <laughs> as this, but it was the same kind of principle, right? Here. Yeah. So this entire area is getting lifted up. And especially here in the mountain ranges, as it gets lifted up, some of the Precambrian rocks are going to break. But they have soft sediments that are sitting on top of them. Uh -huh. And so as the mountains lift up, the soft Paleozoic sediments get deformed. And that's that big bend that we're seeing in the rocks. And it, I mean, it just folds. It's apparent to me when I'm looking at it that this was soft when all of that happened. Even in the vertical yeah. side here, we see some bending and folding. Right. John, also the thing that uh, strikes me, I mean, we saw this layer in the Grand Canyon. I don't know how far away that is, it's a long ways away. All the way across the state of Utah. <laughs> right. But there are mountains in between there. Uh -huh. And you couldn't get those nice flat layers if those mountains were there. So it's obvious the layers were laid down, the mountains were then pushed up. And because they were soft, then they folded instead of broke and were brittle like we see underneath. Yeah, so that's correct, Del. This, all these layers in, in the Paleozoic and the Mesozoic rocks that we're talking about here, these had to be laid down before these mountains are pushed up because those are the layers that are deformed by the, by the mountains sure. rising. Yeah. You see these all over the earth, do you not? Yeah, you do. You see some other big folds like this in places like the Alps, the Appalachian Mountains, and things like that. Again. It's the same argument that these rocks are bending because they're soft. Mm -hmm. they, they haven't hardened yet. The hardening takes place after the bending. You know, one of the things that we want to help people understand is how the Earth got its shape. Mm -hmm. Geologists like to use a word called geomorphology. And as a flood geologist, I think a lot of that shaping actually took place after the flood was over. Well, we've talked a lot about the deformation of those layers, the soft bending, right. and so forth. Uh, but this is something different. John, it seems to me that we're in the middle of a layer. We're, what is this? <laughs> this side used to connect to that side and everything in between. So there's a lot of rock that's been removed in here. Yeah. So let's start with where the rock layer itself came from. I think this layer was made during Noah's flood. I've studied this rock layer in some detail down in Arizona, the Coconino sandstone, called the Weber up here. Uh, the layer extends all the way from California up to the Dakotas. Mm -hmm. And so this used to be solid across here. There was you know, no canyon here. This rock layer went all the way across. And my suspicion is this canyon has been cut by some catastrophe in the years after the flood. We see this in Grand Canyon. We saw it at Mount St. Helens, and we see it here too. 
that you see these relatively small streams in relatively large valleys or large canyons. Even the biggest river we have in the United States, the Mississippi, even though it's a mile wide in places, it sits in a valley that's 100 miles mm -hmm. wide. And mm -hmm. we call those underfit streams, underfit valleys or underfit canyons. And it means that the river flowing through them does not quite match the immense size of the valley of the canyon. My guess is 90% of the canyons and valleys around the world are underfit. And so we think that as uh, mountains were lifted up and as erosion started to, to work on those mountains in the form of uh, flash floods, in the form of mud flows, in the form of glaciation and so on, a lot of those processes could work on canyons like this and enlarge them pretty quickly. John, it seems, uh, at least to me, uh, to say that all the things that carved this canyon out don't seem to be happening today. W what's your take? Yeah, and that's kind of a principle uh, that I think is pretty true in geomorphology is that a landscape goes through major changes uh, catastrophically, maybe like one night at Mount St. Helens, yeah. and then the landscape just sits there until the next catastrophe. And so it's not that we don't have any catastrophes today, but I think the, the number of catastrophes uh, that we have is, is declining from the large number of, of catastrophic events that we would have had as these mountains lifted up. You've mentioned that, that post-flood era, uh, that there was a, a tremendous amount of precipitation. Yeah. Uh, and so an area like this, it doesn't really get a whole lot of rain. That's right. Uh, it was a drastically different climate at that time. It was. Just to the north of here in Fossil Basin and Green River Basin, we've looked at, you know, the lush landscape that was there, the amount of vegetation that had to grow there, and the water that was there. And it's much different from the climate that we have here today. I think from my perspective, as a geologist, climate change is the rule, not the exception. It's something that's been going on ever since the flood was over. John, I think most people would look around here and say, this is a pretty bleak place. It's obviously very arid. Um, and yet you're telling me this is a very special place. Yeah, we're in the southwest corner of Wyoming. I spent several years up here in graduate school. Mm -hmm. And so we are standing uh, on, I know it doesn't look like a lake as you look out here, but we're standing on the sediments that got laid down in a lake and now have turned into rock. Yeah, the lake we're talking about filled up this whole basin, mm -hmm. which is huge. Yeah, and I can actually, from where I'm standing, I can see the edge of the basin over there. You can see these white sediments, and then those are truncated by the darker colored ridge right behind there. And the rocks in that darker colored ridge are actually sitting up like this. So that's the basin edge. Is that then part of the evidence that you would say that this is post-flood? Because right. all of these are all very horizontal. That's right. So the layers that we're looking at here, this is the early part of the Cenozoic, and that would be right at the top of the geologic column. And so we think that Cenozoic rocks in many places around the world, not everywhere, but most of these Cenozoic rocks we think are post-flood rocks. And so underneath of us, underneath of this basin, those Paleozoic and Mesozoic rocks are contorted. But these Cenozoic rocks on top, these are horizontal and flat lying. They're not contorted at all. So that means that the tectonic activity had pretty much ceased when this uh, lake basin was, was filled up. So we have this uh, basin, it, uh, it's filled with water, and we obviously then have a lot of life. When we were in the museum, we saw, I don't know how many different species of just fish and all of that. So this was a flourishing area. Yeah, it's amazing. All kinds of life. Where did all of this life come from? <laughs> so it's interesting. We see things like the bats, the horses, uh, things like the alligators, and we know the birds, all those things, they were air-breathing animals. Many of them lived a lot of their life on the land, and they would have had to be animals that were on the ark. And something 
happens that's different from the rocks that we see underneath. We don't see many mammals in those rocks, and all of a sudden, mm -hmm. we get to these layers, and believe it or not, Dell, there are more mammal species known in the rocks of the Green River Formation than are currently living in Wyoming today. But that sudden arisal in the fossil record of, of mammals uh, should tell us something. Yeah, uh, the very first bats that we find, the very oldest bats that we find are right here in this Green River Formation. And yet they have fully formed wings, they look like modern bats, and where in the world do they come from? Where are the transitional forms from the animals that gave rise to bats if the evolutionary model is true? And so one of the strengths we have in the creation model is that you know, we can explain the sudden appearance of things like bats because we think that those would have been on the ark. And they, they didn't get fossilized during the flood, as far as we know. When we first find the bat fossils, they're in places like this, uh, where they have the potential to become part of the fossil record here. John, this represents a lot of your life here. Uh, you spent a lot of time working on your dissertation here. I did. I spent some summers here collecting fish, studying the layers. This, uh, this place is like home to me. Uh -huh. Can you show me some of the stuff you yeah. were working with? So, we're in a commercial quarry here. It's a place where they dig these fish out and they sell them. And I think if we break some of these layers of rock open, we'll find some fish. I'm hoping that happens. Yeah. So what, we, what we're gonna do is go in right along a seam right in here, and you can see how this whole thing is That's a big slab. Up here. Yeah, it's a big slab. And just kind of get your fingers underneath there. And lift it up. And so now what we're gonna do is we're gonna take some of these chisels. Yeah, we're gonna split down through this going down on it and see what we can find. Is this what your research assistants did? Hold the rock <laughs> while you... That's right, <laughs> all day long. <laughs> yeah, look at that, Del. Oh yeah, look Got at that. Got at least three fish here. Yeah. So there's one, one there, one right there, another one there, another one there. Oh my goodness. That was a good break right there. Yeah. So awesome. these all look like Nydia. Just a little herring type fish. Boy, that one is a really nice one yeah, right there. Yeah, is. Well, if you look at the edge right here, you can see multiple layers in here. Yeah, I do. And they're, they're not very thick. They're almost as thick as yes. playing cards. Uh -huh. And the conventional idea is that each pair of a layer, a dark layer and a light layer, lasted a year. But you look at, at fish like this guy down here, I do not see a single bone out of place. The fins are nice and, and splayed out right there. And based on my fish experiments, that thing sank down to the bottom of the lake and was buried in a calcium carbonate layer within a day after it laid down to the bottom. And I think that's the only way that you can explain such good preservation. And, and not only we see it there, but that fish, that fish, and that fish, they all have really exceptional preservation yeah. and they, they have to be buried quickly. Yeah, there's really just a lot of fine detail in that fossil there. So those uh, small, tiny layers that we're looking at here, those are not annual layers. I, I don't see any way that they could be annual layers based on daily. how well the person, yeah, I would think almost daily layers mm -hmm. here. Something was different about the water chemistry here in that it was precipitating a lot of this calcium carbonate out, which was covering the fish. The other thing that's really interesting about this particular outcrop is there's uh, several volcanic ash beds in here. And so the volcanoes are nearby, maybe some of the ones up in Yellowstone. Uh, they would erupt and the ash would settle down through the lake. And here's this nice orange layer right here. That would be one volcanic ash bed. Here's another orange layer, wow. not as thick. That would be another one. Here's another volcanic ash right here. And here's another ash bed that's maybe an inch and a half yeah, thick. Right. Uh, these ash beds actually help us to tell time in the lake. How's that? Um, if we can trace these ash beds and confidently know that they're the same from place to place in the lake basin, uh, for example, we can look at this thickness between yeah. those two ash beds right there, and we know that that thickness of Green River formation was laid down at the same time, whether 
were right here in this spot or over at the edge of the lake. And it happens that we know these aren't yearly events because you can find this ash bed here, count the layers, find it at the edge of the lake, and at the edge of the lake, the thickness is more. Huh. And so- Is that uh, more layers? More layers at the edge of the lake. And that's because you have more sediments and whatnot coming in from the edge of the lake. And so we know these aren't uh, yearly laminations. We know right, that, that wouldn't the, make sense. The laminations are not equal from here to there. There's about 30% more layers at the edge of the lake than there is in the middle. And I don't know exactly how much time is represented between those ash beds, but one thing I do know is that the time is the same, whether it be weeks, months, or years sure. between those ash beds. I know that there's mm -hmm. the same amount of time. And mm -hmm. so I was able to study the, the fish and the decay of the fish and the preservation of the fish. Uh, during the same time in, in the lake's history. So I think the take home point is that the fossil fish and the other fossils here show that these sediments were laid down rapidly. Yes, it was after the flood, but even after the flood, we have processes that produce fast layers. You know, John, one of the things that has really impressed me is that you're not content with just sitting in in an office somewhere, yeah. but you want to be out here looking at the reality yeah. to understand the truth and the facts. Yeah. And I appreciate that about you and that you understood you needed a PhD to help you do that. Is that important? It is. It, at first I thought, you know, maybe why do I need a PhD? <laughs> why do I need to, to learn more? But the thing was that I didn't understand is how it would advance my thinking and how it would cause me to think deeper and consider other mm -hmm. possibilities. So would you say that for a young person who is considering one of these scientific areas, that it would be important, number one, to get their doctorate, and it's important for them to understand there's a whole lot yeah. of things to be looking at? I think, Del, there's two things that are really important uh, for a young scientist. And uh, number one is to become well-trained. You need to interact not only with other creation scientists, but you need to interact with conventional scientists too. But the other thing, Dell, is they need to be grounded well in scripture. So they need to understand a biblical model and they need to take things like this and put these kinds of things within the record. Uh, the biblical record uh, doesn't tell us everything we wanna know. It, it kind of gives us a framework and we need the, the new generation to come up and, and begin to look deeper into some things. We, we don't know all the answers here yet. Um, I would really like to know how much time is in between that ash bed and uh -huh. that ash bed. Yeah. And we need some new scientists out here that are trained to think well to work on problems like that. One of the things I noticed about these scientists was the importance of teamwork. A key member of their team is a scientist named Ray Strong. Ray is a Canadian who has developed a special set of skills working in the oil and gas industry for the last four decades. Although I wasn't able to travel up to Calgary myself, we sent a team to interview him in his laboratory. My wife told me one time she felt sorry for me getting up early in the morning and having to come into work and I said, hold, hold on a minute. <laughs> I come to work and play. This is kind of the way the field of geology is. Every single sample that you look at is different. It has a different story to tell. It has different characteristics. There's always something new. I come to work and play every day. <laughs> so we need to unbox the samples and get them prepared for cutting. Basically, what we're looking at are rock samples that have been collected in the Grand Canyon and begin doing the technical rock analysis on those samples. This involves, first of all, thin section manufacture. And so this is taking rock materials down to the thickness that you can actually see through them. And this sample is very carefully labeled with an arrow pointing up with top and an identifier, which in this case is, there it is, CCF1, which is Carbon Canyon Fold Number 1. 
But initially we need to cut these rocks, dry them, and get them prepped for thin section analysis. All right, this will be noisy. Okay, right now I'm going to put an orientation mark on this rock to show what end is up. That will be crucial to determine how the bedding structure is affected by how the rock materials originally were laid down. The sample is now ready for drying in preparation for liquid epoxy impregnation in this sample. Many professional geologists aren't aware of how to do this process. Uh, there are only a handful of people, perhaps in the entire world, who know how to do this kind of thing, at least to do it well. L literally a handful of people. Okay, the epoxy is used for stabilizing the sample. And if you fill up all the pore space with epoxy, you wind up, first of all, being able to identify where the porosity is. And secondly, you stabilize all the very fine material found in the pore spaces. So this is a high pressure cell which we use to inject the liquid epoxy into the pore spaces in the sample. In the morning, we can retrieve it. The epoxy will be solidified, and then we can handle that piece of rock safely all through the rest of the next part of the process. It is important that we continue this work and that it succeed because I believe there's a whole side of scientific investigation that has been largely ignored. And one of the aims that I have is to chase that particular pathway and look at data that may be not necessarily mainstream, but is very, very interesting and is significant and so that's my endeavor in working with Andrew, for example, is to see what the data says and where there's supporting evidence to make sure that that's well documented. Okay, what we're doing now is taking the epoxy away from the bottom surface and we're exposing the rock that's been impregnated with blue dyed epoxy. And so, what that does is allow us to get a nice, flat, optically planar surface. And in this case, it's extremely important. We're not mistaking scratches for fractures. So we don't want to leave scratches in the rock surface. We want to make sure that all the scratches are out so that the fractures can be easily identified. Okay, so we're going to move on to the staining process and then it will be ready for mounting to glass. We don't want to induce any kind of fracturing into the sample, and so mounting this to glass using the cyanoacrylate glue, crazy glue, ensures that we have a good, stable surface with which to work. Imagine trying to work with a single piece of hair and trying to grind it without affecting the character of the hair. We want to make sure that we don't disturb the mineralogy of the sample as we go through the cutting and grinding processes. This slide we will now take to our grinding lapse where we'll thin it down to about 30 micron thickness. And this is kind of where the art comes into play do just a quick look in the microscope here and it looks like we're pretty well at 30 micron thickness all the way across the entire thin section. We have the grains seen as being very clear. The material showing up as blue is empty space and in cross polarized light if showing either as a gray or as a pale straw yellow. And that tells us that we're right on the 30 micron thickness. Back in the day when we were really busy, 
we would do anywhere between 80 to 100 of these types of samples a day. Personally, I've probably done in the order of about 20,000, I guess. Now we'll take the slide and look at it under the good petrographic microscope, which is a special kind of microscope made for analyzing geological thin sections. And then we move on to more elaborate testing methodologies like scanning electron microscopy. We'll take in gold coat the sample. Now the amount of gold that we're gonna put on that is very, very small. <laughs> Almost no value whatsoever. But it's necessary for conducting electrons along the surface of the sample in order to get the image that we want. It gives you almost a 3D visual image of the rock materials that you're looking at at a very high magnification, which allows us to determine whether certain features are found in that particular rock. The electron beam runs down the column and is scanned back and forth across the sample. Okay, so we've got some very nice quartz cement showing up in here. There's some more quartz cement right there, but beautiful quartz overgrowths. Basically, the creation model provides alternatives to the explanations that are, in some cases, somewhat deficient. So looking at the creation model, for example, provided almost a stark contrast even though we were looking at the same data, we were quite often in disagreement over what the interpretation was to the data that we were both looking at. And I've watched this over my entire career now, as I've been involved in publishing of papers, presentations at professional conferences, and just seeing how that contrast plays out in terms of how people look at the world. Well, there was a lot of analysis that still had to be done on those thin sections. But in the meantime, I wanted to get a better understanding of the forces that were involved that brought about those folds. And so I called my friend Steve Austin, and he suggested we go back to the Grand Canyon, but not to the bottom. But we needed to see it from the air, because the forces are so large, they're so huge. You've got to get away, you've got to get higher in order to see it. What a great opportunity to see all this. No better way to see the country than by helicopter. In overview, it's just a tremendous way to see it. Boy, what an amazing thing this is to come over this edge. Wow, unbelievable. You know, Steve, it's really the first time I've got this sensation of all the excavation, so to speak, in the Grand Canyon. It makes me begin to imagine that it was just solid layers all the way across. Yeah, you can imagine the continuity of strata through here. When you say the continuity, you're talking about the layers that existed on this side of the canyon, they exist on the other side, but now they're gone. You're looking for the, the continuity between the layer here and the layer yes. over there. And that the strata were once continuous across where the canyon is now. And we're looking at the Kaibab Plateau. It's a large part of the Colorado Plateau that has been arched. It makes an arch structure that bends the strata. We have a name for it. It's called the East Kaibab Monocline. So, Steve, when we talk about the monocline, we're talking about something forcing all of that massive material up. What, what are the forces that are causing that to happen? Most creation geologists that I talk to suggested specific ocean floor that was shoved under western North America. The shoving of the ocean floor underneath western part of North America 
cause low density buoyant material to be down there and then at the end of the flood it rose uh -huh. uh, just because it was lighter and less dense than that would they, push everything above it, it up it will push the plateau up higher yeah. notice here comes the arch okay yeah. now look for this look for the strata and how they're bent oh yeah I see that okay so we're we're looking down this uh, flexure along the East Kaibab monocline, a, uh, a line where there's been a lot of bending yes. of the strata. You see it all the way up there. And the strata are horizontal, and all You're of right. a sudden they go vertical. Yes. Notice, it looks like soft sediment deformation. You could see the strata as they're, uh, they're horizontal, and all of a sudden they turn 90 degrees. Isn't and that amazing? And they're not crumbled. They're, they're folded, uh, you know, like soft taffy. Now, as we come over the top of this, we're going to see Carbon Canyon down there. Yes. So the monocline forms this soft sediment fold structure. And everywhere we see that monocline, we see the bending rather than the breaking. Is that yes. correct? It's extraordinary. But this is kind of normal Colorado Plateau monocline, okay? So the rock was not hard when it was flexed. It was soft. But there may be some other faulting in here. It may behave brittly afterwards. If we find it where it's broken, uh, then that would indicate those layers had already hardened. Yeah, we're seeing the sequence of sedimentation and tectonics very closely associated in time, not separated by hundreds of millions of years. Yes. In other words, tectonics and sedimentation occur together, not separated by geologic ages. And when you say tectonics, you're talking about the movement uh, that uh, uplifts, uplifts the, the, the mountains and the plateaus yeah. and all of that. And so if the sedimentary layers are soft, while that is happening, then we'll get those bends and folds. Yes. That makes sense to me. Well, I have to at least comment on the beauty of all of this. Yes. Notice, again, the difference in elevation. Yes. We're flying below the elevation of Kaibab limestone on the north rim of Grand Canyon on the right side of us here. But it's way below us over here. And it's here way below side. us on the left. Yeah. It drops in elevation. Along what? That monocline. Line. It forms the barrier, the arch structure here. That's ultimately why we have the lake basin that was able to fill and then spill through the Kaibab upwarp, I believe, to form the Grand Canyon. I can see the, the scum on the surface there. That's the tufa deposit. Uh -huh. And that's the bathtub ring of the big lake that was filled in this basin. Can you imagine a lake in this basin up at 6,100 feet elevation making that bathtub ring deposit? So all of this in front of us, this was all covered with that lake. We call it Hopi Lake and it comes up to a natural dam up here Yeah. at this point you're talking about. And that's, that's where at some point for some reason it breached. It just gave way or maybe an earthquake or something. Just overtopping of a, a natural earth dam can create Which spillway is erosion. erosion. And there's no such thing as slow failure of a natural dam in spillover. Uh -huh. When spillover erosion occurs on a natural dam, it erodes rapidly. Where do you think this is occurring in, in terms of the, of the flood? I like to think of it as post-flood. The rock is already hardened. The monocline has already been flexed. The upwarp has occurred. The rocks are hardened. And then the, the overtopping and spillway erosion of the solid rock. So this could be 100 years. Hundreds of years after the afterwards. floods, possibly. How many different lakes are we talking about? There may be three or four three different or four. lakes associated with the Grand Canyon itself. So uh, 
above Lee's Ferry in the Lake Powell area, Kapiritz Plateau. Behind that, another lake that could fail. And they, my view is the lakes failed from the top down. The spillover of this Hopi Lake over the Kaibab Upwarp into the next basin below it created what? Another lake below it. And that would be Toroweep Lake. The, uh -huh. the, the drainage basins upstream filled first and they spilled, destroyed their dams by spillway erosion and they drained to the west. And you, you created the Grand Canyon by top down failing of dams uh -huh. into and lowland areas. So it's, it, the erosion is channeled to form a canyon. Okay, and it's a straight canyon, but yeah, it's channelized. And that is a, what we see. So we see er erosion in channels by spillover, it looks like. And so the, the lake didn't take millions of years to drain. It didn't take millions of years for the Colorado River to erode the Grand Canyon. And, and you know, really, Steve, I can look around and at least imagine and envision this wasn't carved out by a river. This is the kind of thing that you see when massive water just floods and it just evacuates all of that yeah. material. And thinking about breach dams and the notching of the plateau by spillover, that is the latest geologic rage in thinking. The old way of thinking about Grand Canyon is, oh, it was eroded over millions of years. Uh, no, uh, that, that's becoming unpopular among geologists. In fact, as I talk to geologists, very few geologists are defending that way of thinking. They are going to something freaky and catastrophic <laughs> like yeah. you know, overtopping of lakes. Right. There's an Ice Age lake in Montana that failed through uh, an ice dam across eastern Washington into the Columbia River Basin. A huge failure there. So Steve, let me step back here for a second and talk about these uh, lakes again. There's a massive amount of water uh, represented in what we're looking at here. Is that caused from the huge amount of precipitation that was occurring as a result of the warm oceans or or is there some other uh, source for all of that water? Well, I like a warm ocean at the end of the flood. You could have a rainy period uh, for hundreds of years after the flood. We could fill these basins with rainwater, and then they, uh, they spill and overtop the landscape. And wouldn't that be a great place to survive after the uh, global flood? next to a, a nice big lake <laughs> with uh, uh, lots of water and well-irrigated landscape. Until it breached. Until it breached, yeah, <laughs> okay. And then today it's rather arid, yes. isn't it? If you had lakefront property here, uh, it all went away quickly. Yeah, cause there could be palm trees. There's evidence uh, here of camels, of geese, uh, shorebirds on the lake. There's evidence of pike minnow. The bathtub ring right there next to where the failure point is, that's icing on the cake. That makes it real to me that the edge of the lake was up there next to the breach point. So what we see makes a strong case for some kind of catastrophic deposition of the strata of the Grand Canyon, a giant global flood, if you will, the very quick bending and upheaval of the strata forming the Kaibab Plateau, and then in the post-flood period, the spillover erosion of the plateau. In other words, we have the pieces of the puzzle yes. that seem to assemble themselves. So we have an explanation. It's a hypothesis with extreme explanatory power. And it's consistent with the framework of the Bible. A lot of us don't realize the amount of time and effort that it takes for a scientist, once they have done all the field work and all the lab work, to bring everything together. They now need to write it up, 
They need to put it in a form in which the general scientific community can look at it and review it. So we had the opportunity to go back to Cedarville and sit down with Andrew and John to discuss their findings. We talked not only about what they had found, but also about the implications of their research. Type thing. And are these all the slides that, that Ray yes. sent? Yes, he sent them to us in boxes like this, and you can see what they look like. They're just, uh -huh. but of course, these were hand delivered. He, he came down at a meeting that John was attending and hand delivered. You wouldn't trust these to the post. You don't send them through the mail. <laughs> I can and understand then, then that. John came and delivered them to me. So, is this what you have then under the microscope? Yep. Yes. How long have you been studying these? Well, I've literally spent months, you know, going screen by screen by screen, moving the stage backwards and forwards, systematically going through each slide, taking photos, recording details. Hundreds and hundreds of yeah. hours under the microscope. Yeah. And I've got thousands of, of photographs at different points. Every time I took notes, I took a photograph so I could go back to that. So after these months and months of looking at these uh, thin slides, what did you find? Well. I put this on the screen deliberately because this is a sample that comes from right in the bend of that major fold okay. in the Tapete sandstone. And so it's a good test case because if there ever was going to be a, a sample that was going to show the mechanical or the metamorphic effects from slow, gradual heat and pressure changes and, and moving around, it would be this sample. So let me walk you through it. First of all, you can see that white, those white grains, yes. okay, the, the really white ones, that's the mineral quartz, which is window glass, okay? We can see some of these spaces are still there. This is the blue highlighting these spaces. Well, in this instance, what happened, more quartz grew, and you can see how it's joined these two grains together, and you can see that little sharp point there, yes. this quartz cement grown into that space. So what happens is when it's deposited, there's water in between those sand grains, but the water has chemicals dissolved in it. And so when the water dries out, those chemicals precipitate and fill in all the spaces between the sand grains and harden it, making it a cement. So that cement is like glue. It holds the mm -hmm. grains together. So sand in a sandbox would be really loose, but if you put some glue in there, or what geologists call cement. That's what kind of holds the rock together and makes it hard. What does it tell you when you see that? Well, it's in pristine condition. It hasn't changed. You know, this is in the hinge of that fold. You'd expect when the folding occurred, millions of years later, supposedly, that cement should have been disrupted. It yes. should have been crushed. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And right. ma maybe it would have to regrow again, but you'd still see fracturing that was healed. Uh, but you don't see that in any of this. You still see the original pores. Yeah, so it, it tells us that the cement was added after the rocks okay. were bent. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. oh, all right, so we were talking earlier about uh, you know, breaking and crumbling of a very hard rock from a, a larger standpoint. Now, what you're talking about is you look at the small pieces, you also would find crumbling. Yes. But you don't see that. No, that's right. You can see where grains have been compressed hmm. close to one another, and you can still see the original outlines. Here's some more cement over here that's joined that grain to this grain. So let me ask this question then. Is that the cement formed after it was bent, mm -hmm. not before? That's right. right. Now, you also took samples a long way away from that fold. Mm -hmm and you wanted to look at those and compare those to in the fold. We haven't seen one of those. Do you have yeah, a, a slide right of that? Yeah, I've got one right here. one right here. And, and it has exactly the same features. Now let's, we're gonna have to adjust this again. Let's get it back into focus. Because we can move it around. Okay, you can see there, again, you've got the same. Mm -hmm. You've got the blue spaces, you've got, look at all the different sized grains of, of the white ones of quartz, you've got felspar, you've even got some rock fragments there. So, you know, it, it doesn't look any different. So let me put you on the spot here, Andrew. If I were to mix up a slide from the fold <laughs> mm -hmm. and a slide, how far away was it? A uh, this one here, that was above Little Colorado River. So 
as the crow flies five to six miles. Okay, so if I were to switch those up and put them under the microscope and say, <laughs> Andrew, is this from the fold or is this from five miles away? Could you tell? I couldn't tell because there's no radical difference. That tells you They're something. essentially the same. And okay. that was the whole point of taking those yes. samples mm -hmm. to be a control. The fact that we find them the same, every sample of the sandstone has exactly the same features, is quite telling. It means they folded before they hardened. Well, let's go back to the conventional paradigm that would say that the folding took place uh, as a result of a metamorphosis in the rocks. What would this look like if that had occurred? Would it look different and why? Uh, there would be a whole set of different features that are not present here. Mm -hmm. yeah, metamorphic rocks under the microscope look distinctly different from this. Here's a slide that, that might even look closer. Uh, when you take a sandstone, which is the type of rock that we found in that fold, yes. and you put a sandstone under metamorphic heat and pressure, it's going to look something like this. This rock is called a quartzite. Uh, the, the dominant mineral here is going to be quartz. And one oh, of the things yeah. you notice right away is that there's not any blue in there. Right. And that means that all the cement has grown in between the grains. You can still see some of the grains in there. I think, Andrew, if you put it under cross-polarized light, uh, the, yeah. the grains uh, show up even better. Here's where we look at under, under cross-polars. Mm -hmm. But you can see how these grains uh, interlock with one another, just like pieces this in a jigsaw puzzle. This is the puzzle you were talking about. That's right. And here's the puzzle put together. Turn the light up a little bit more. And you see how Very you different. lots of these connecting points, these junction points that are often, you know, three grains at what we call a triple point. So, Del, we think if the conventional paradigm were true, that the rock samples we took out of that fold would look, look more, more like, like this than, than the sample of sandstone that we looked at. Well, to an untrained eye, I can tell you this, it is a radically different picture than what we saw. Uh, so it makes one think <laughs> the current paradigm is not correct. Is that what you're assuming Yeah, and you can, here? you can see why it was important to yes. make the thin sections and to look at, because you can't see these effects in a, a hand specimen. You've got to really dive into these grains at this microscopic level and, you know, all geologists do this, it's part of the detective work. You have your framework of thinking and you say to yourself, well, if I go and get samples, what do I expect to find? And you set up some questions to answer and what you expect to find. And then you go out and you do the tests to check whether, mm -hmm. and if you don't find what you already predicted you're going to find, you're going to have to change how change you your how, model. try and change your model sure. for how you, how you understand these rocks. So what are you now waiting on from Ray? Well, Ray is also going to uh, talk to us about the, the results he got from using a scanning electron microscope, which is going in an, an even higher power of magnification. This is just in two dimensions. He's able to look in three dimensions. You'll be able to see the quartz cement, the way it's grown between the quartz grains. And that'll tell us whether there's been any mechanical disruption or whether the cement has occurred as the last stage in the mm -hmm. whole process. Okay. There we go. Oh, hello, Ray. It's so good to see you again. And uh, unfortunately, we got to do this by Zoom. And uh, I have uh, in my lab today, uh, Del Tackett uh, is with us. Hey, Ray. And, uh, Andrew Snelling yeah. is with us. Good to see us. you again, Ray. It's hard to believe it's <laughs> nearly two years since I was up there last with you in the lab. I know. I, I was just looking at some of the images that we were doing while you were up here. And uh, looking at the dates on them, and it's hard to believe. So Ray, we want to look at uh, one of the thin sections from the, the tight fold in Carbon Canyon. And uh, here's the uh, thin section. And one of the things that struck me uh, right away when looking at these thin sections was the amount of porosity uh, in these rocks. Even at this place where the bend was uh, really tight. Uh, there's still a lot of empty space in there. And Ray, could we look at a, an, an image from this uh, very same rock sample, uh, sample number 10, uh, and uh, let us know your observations about what you see with the scanning electron microscope. 
So here we have an example of a scanning electron microscopy image. If you can see my cursor here, that's a sand grain right there. And associated with that sand grain are a number of overgrowths of quartz. Ray, when you say overgrowth, what do you mean by that? Okay, this, this is actually the cement. The important thing to look at here is that the individual overgrowths that you see here have not been disturbed. Their contacts have not been disturbed by any kind of mechanical deformation. So we're actually seeing that the, the cement hasn't been damaged mm -hmm. because you've got these pristine ends of the crystals as they've, as they've grown on the original set sand grains. So that shows that the, the bending took place and then the rock became a solid. Exactly. And of course this is at a much higher magnification so any even subtle deformation would show up between these cemented particles. So Ray, that sample was, as you know, from the Carbon Canyon Fold in the hinge, and uh, that was in the tapetes. It's probably going to be helpful now if we look at a regional sample. So that's TSS3. We might want to just look at that too because that's way, a long way away from these folds. So it, there's a, an awful lot to see in this particular image, but uh, the overgrowths are basically two types. We have beautiful quartz overgrowths but you've also got precipitation of clays, which lends to, I guess, what you'd call the dirty appearance of this particular rock. The overgrowths that you see here are quite pristine, indicating that they've been growing into open pore space. I don't see anything unusual here. These rocks haven't been dislocated haven't been fractured, all those sorts of things. So I asked us earlier of, of Andrew, if, if we were to put several of these pictures, if I were to mix them up, would you be able to uh, tell me, you know, which belongs in the hinge and which does not? No, I couldn't. <laughs> and it seems to me that that is, from my perspective, uh, kind of the summary. Oh, yeah. of this, is yeah. it? And what you wanted to see in the very yeah. beginning. Well, the sequence is sedimentation, folding, then hardening. That's correct. Now, you can help me here uh, because it seems to me uh, from a very amateur perspective at this point uh, that we're looking at a very significant finding. Anything that begins to show that a theory is wrong is a major uh, observation. And uh, I'm almost getting a little deja vu here uh, back when we were looking at the soft dinosaur tissue. <laughs> we were looking at something that from the conventional paradigm's perspective should not be here, right? The soft dinosaur tissue should not be here because it is millions and millions There's of no years old. There's no mechanism to preserve uh, it for millions of correct. years. Correct. And now we're looking uh, at a microscopic level of uh, the grains and the cementation and all of these things that we've been looking at. And we're seeing uh, from a conventional paradigm perspective what shouldn't be there. That to me is, is fascinating. Yeah. And, and I'm excited to, to, to be here yeah. to, to share that uh, with you. And it kind of blows the mind to think that we're looking here at, at, we've looked here at the microscopic level, but it gives us a narrative to explain, you know, the building of mountains. Mm -hmm. So it, it's quite dramatic because, as you say, you know, just these observations under the microscope help us to put the pieces of the puzzle together in the chronology. Mm -hmm. And when these mountains formed, it wasn't hundreds of millions of years after the layers were deposited, it was only months after the layers were deposited. And that's a radical departure from yes. conventional uh, explanations of the building of mountains. Yeah. I'm reminded of a trip that was organized for the heads of our international oil and gas company. Part of that was a helicopter trip over Jasper, Alberta. 
Well, there are massive, massive folds in the Rocky Mountains. And one of the individuals who happened to be an engineer, long time standing with this particular company, he later recounted to me, he said, I saw all these folds in the rock. I can't even imagine how you could think that those would have been formed in solid cemented rocks. They had to have been soft when those big folds were formed. So it's critical to state that we're looking at scientific evidence. We're not imagining this stuff. We're actually looking at scientific evidence that supports a particular model, one of a young Earth and short events that made the features that we observe. Ray makes an important point. There really is a lot of evidence that supports the creation model. But we've only been able to show you a brief summary of just one research project. Even in this documentary, there were many conversations we had to leave out, details we couldn't include, scientific evidence that took too long to explain. But my hope is that you have a new appreciation for how creation science actually works. I also hope this film reminds you that Genesis is the best explanation for everything we see in the world around us. I was fortunate enough to meet up with Andrew one more time at my home in Colorado, where I spend every day under the shadow of an enormous mountain. So Andrew, looking back at all that we've talked about and all that we've looked at, you're still in the process of this whole research, right? How many well, uh, papers have you already published? Two have already been published, a third is in the process of being published and there's four more, four more to come. And so those papers are long and detailed with all the microscope photographs and all the descriptions of the rocks because it's reporting all the observational mm -hmm. data that anyone can go and look at and read. Uh, I guess the question is, how is the world going to respond to that? So if they were to admit that my evidence indicates there was a catastrophic global flood with a short period of time of catastrophic processes, a humongous amount of energy and earth movements to raise up these mountains, they're going to have to forget their millions of years. So they're going to have to reject their own interpretive framework. So they're either going to ignore the research which is what they commonly do, or attack the scientists. And yet you still go on. You uh, still proceed in this work. Absolutely, because it's part of our worship as we've been given dominion over the earth by God. We've been given brains to use. He expects us to use them. It's an act of worship to him. And of course, we've got a lot more work to do. I mean. What about the animals? What were they doing at this time? What about the people that were descended from Noah? There's lots of questions that we have yet to answer to link from the time that Noah got off the ark with the rise of the mountains into the civilizations that everyone is familiar with. So we've got a lot of work ahead of us to get a fully integrated package of explaining the world around us as it is today. So that uh, brings me back again to some things that we've talked about before. We talked about them earlier in the previous film, and that is the whole notion of creation scientists and the processes that a creation scientist goes through, and that has all been exampled for us in this project. Well, anyone can collect rock samples, anyone can do laboratory analyses, but they're just numbers, they're just observations of minerals. You've got to be able to put that within an interpretive framework. And I start with the interpretive fame framework that Genesis is literal history, uh, that God has given us that written account of history and it, it describes the Genesis flood. And so then I start to look at the data, the observational data within that framework. And so that's what creation scientists do. We ask questions and then we get do the research to see if we can answer those questions, but all within the interpretive framework of Genesis. Andrew, there are still a lot of questions in that are left unanswered. Where do you see creation science going from this point forward? Well, actually, I'm quite excited because we see another generation being raised up mm. for, for which we can hand on the torch. 
And you know, my research and, and others who are doing research like this are setting examples for the younger generation. We want to equip them and challenge them with the things that have yet to be answered to take up the questions mm -hmm. and run with it and do, do the necessary research. So uh, I'm quite excited about what God can do with young people in the years ahead. I'm Dale Tackett. I'm with my friend Thomas Purifori, and I'm excited to tell you uh, that we have begun what we're calling the Genesis Fund, mm -hmm. the ability to try and fund some of the research that we saw all the time during the Genesis film. Lots of it. Is de yeah. Desperately needed. What, what are we going to do with this fund? So we've partnered with a 501c3 um, that has set up this fund where the money will be used to basically support creation science and enable a rising generation of young right. scientists to be able to pursue their education and their dreams and their really their scientific endeavors. Creation science is not funded. It's not funded publicly. The only way it's going to be funded uh, is privately. And that's what we're hoping uh, will happen. We're hoping that you would find yourself uh, wanting to support this kind of work. So if this sounds like something you'd like to be a part of, please help support us and more important, help support creation science. The exciting thing about this uh, to me is that we will also be encouraging young people uh, to move into these areas, to be a creation scientist themselves. So I'm excited about this, excited about the possibility of not only funding these, but giving you an opportunity to film and That's let right. people see how that process works. You know, this is really a fascinating process. Just a small handful of folks, and we would meet a scientist out in the field, and then we'd spend hours together. And in that process of interviewing them and walking from one location to the other and looking at all of this amazing stuff, I think I learned more than anybody will ever learn just by looking at the film because there was so much material. And that's why we're doing Beyond his Genesis History and in volume one to look at the rocks and the fossils. The data that we're looking at is the data that matches exactly what the history that God has given to us about why all of this occurred and how it occurred. It's not just enough, I think, to give people a survey. It's really important for people to understand more of the details, to have a deeper foundation of the fundamental truth of what that evidence is showing.